Good evening, and thank you for attending. My name is Denise McKelvey, and I'll be the moderator for this evening's candidate debate. The Citizens Clean Election Commission is the sponsor for this evening's event. The Clean Election Act is a campaign finance reform measure initiated by Arizona citizens and passed by voters in 1998. Participation as a clean elections candidate is strictly voluntary. The system provides full funding for qualified candidates who agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and rules. To qualify for funding, participating candidates must illustrate the support of their constituents by gathering $5 qualifying contributions from registered voters in their legislative district. The candidates agree to adhere to contribution and spending limits and may not accept money from special interest groups. They also agree to participate in these forums. As we move into the debate, we encourage audience questions. If you have a question, please print them clearly on the card given to you when you walked in and hold it up. One of our volunteers will pick it up from you and deliver them to me. We screen questions for clarity, to eliminate duplications, speeches, or personal attacks on candidates. If you need another card, just raise your hand. There's an independent timer who will see to it the candidate has a set time to answer questions and will tell Mr. Knighting when his time is up. Our format this evening is three minutes for the opening statement, a quick lightning round, two minutes to answer questions, and three minutes in a closing statement. We ask that you remain polite to the candidate and give him a fair and uninterrupted hearing, no matter how strongly you may agree or disagree with anything being said. This means no applause, outbursts, or cheers, except now as we introduce the candidate. This is especially important as closed captioning services will be made available after this debate for those individuals that are hearing impaired. As such, I will refer to the candidate by his full name prior to each question and ask the candidate to speak clearly into his microphone. Our participant for this evening is Mr. Kelly Knighting, an American's elect candidate running for a seat in the Senate. Mr. Knighting, will you start your opening remarks, please? Yes, ma'am. I would first like to commend Clean Air Elections uh, for what they're doing. I think it's a great thing that they're doing. And uh, I would just like to introduce myself, first of all, by saying that I am, I am very involved in the political process, not so much as a candidate, but as a party leader in the Ind Independent American Party, nationally. The Independent American Party has ballot access in two st states with their name and two additional states that have an affiliation or an alliance agreement with the National Independent American Party. The two states we have ballot access in are Utah and New Mexico. And uh, the two states that we have an alliance agreement with the leaders of that party are Oregon in the Constitution Party, that's not affiliated with the National Constitution Party, and also Americans Elect here in Arizona where I live. And so those are the four states where we have ballot access in, and it's a privilege to live in Arizona and to run for office in one of these states. First and foremost, uh, as far as principles are concerned, the founding fathers won their in our independence uh, many years ago, about 240 years ago, and they were the ones that were going to sacrifice their life, their liberty, and their sacred honor to achieve independence from England. Their voice should count the loudest. I hope we would all agree with that. They were the one that put their money where their mouth is, so to speak. They were the one that, that went out and fought and bled and died for what we have. And it's, it's a mockery in my mind to, to think that our voice or a differing opinion is better than what our founding fathers originally said uh, way back in 1776 era. So the, uh, my, I have been involved in, in the political process from a founding father's vantage point 
for years. And I know the principles uh, that our founding fathers bled and died for. Those are the principles that I stand for. We have gone far afield from those principles. And it's no accident that uh, our country is in dismay and even you know, running out of steam and, and lots of scary things are, are coming. But the solution has been and always will be the Founding Fathers' voice. And so that's where I stand, that's where I'm gonna stand in every question here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. In an attempt to lighten the mood for tonight's debate, we are going to do a quick lightning round of this or that. This is, will allow us to get to know you a little better. Mr. Knighting, please answer with one word. Droid, iPhone, or Windows? A droid or Windows? Or iPhone? Oh, uh, Android. CNN, Fox News, or MSNBC? None of the above? Fox. Facebook or Twitter? Facebook. Mac or PC? PC. Lumberjack, Sun Devil, or Wildcat? Uh, Sun Devil. Thank you. We will now move into our debate questions. Our first question of the evening. What will be your top priority if elected? Uh, my top priority will be educating people on the principles of our founding fathers. And uh, it, would be, it would be doing that in the election process. Uh, one of the, for example, one of the principles of our founding fathers originally was that there should be no parties. I mean, George Washington in the farewell address spoke of the baneful or poisonous effects of the spirit of party. And look at the parties we have. And our second president, uh, John Adams, said, basically I'm paraphrasing, he said that there's nothing he can think of more volatile to this country than uh, two parties in opposition to each other, fighting each other under their leaders. He says this, in my opinion, and my apprehension, is the greatest evil under our Constitution. And so we've created what he's feared the most. Why on earth do we have political parties involved in the election process? Why do laws favor political parties? It should not be. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it's just asking for what George Washington called the spirit of party to come in and derail our country. Because you have, you have powers, you have big money powers coming in and buying elections. And uh, everywhere you go, it's, it's like, you know, you know, this person won at $20 a vote, and this other person in this other state won at uh, $12 a vote. And they're both either Republicans or Democrats. So educating the people on what will secure a great state would be my highest priority. Thank you. Next question, Mr. Knighting. If elected, what committees would you like to serve on and why? Well, I would like to serve on what, what I just mentioned, a, a, a committee that would take out political parties out of the election process in Arizona. Uh, I would like to serve on a committee that brings more education of our founding fathers and of the era of our founding fathers to schools and to people learning in, in all aspects, whatever age you are. I, I would like to uh, be on committees that draw attention to laws that, that are uh, corrupt so that we can overturn these laws and speak for our founding fathers in, uh, in getting these things off, off of the books. They have no business in a free country being here. And, uh, and so I would like to be on committees to, to go through our constitution, the state constitution and the state bylaws and make those documents as holy and as pure as our original constitution. I, I, our constitution was originally 
supposed to be interpreted through the Declaration of Independence. That was law. And uh, we've gotten rid of that. We've, I would like to be on a committee to allow prayer and to encourage prayer in schools and in all avenues and all walks of life before NFL football games for the Arizona Cardinals in every avenue to encourage prayer to be taught and, and spoken and prayed. And I would, uh, so those, those are the committees offhand that I think are the most important that I would like to be involved in. Our founding fathers were religious people and they would not, they would not see current society well in our, in our forgetfulness of God Almighty. Thank you. Our next question is on jobs. Arizona's unemployment rate has remained around 7% this year and has been slow to recover from the Great Recession. What do you propose to improve the job climate in our state? Jobs are one of the areas where the Founding Fathers made a point to say, and, and to be very clear about this, government has no business interfering in our capitalistic society, in capitalism, in, in our free market society. Government's best thing to do is to get out of the way. We have so many laws and so many corrupt laws that interfere and regulate jobs and government. And people that have a genius and they want to express that genius and they want to make money in their genius. They have an incredible talent and they're like, they're thinking to themselves, wow, if I can just make this work, this is going to be so beautiful. And here comes government kicking them in the teeth, beating them down to where they don't have any more money to pursue their dream, to pursue their talent, to pursue their goal, to pursue their God-given gifts and abilities. We need to get out of the way with jobs. We need to totally be out. The, the object of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. The object of government is not to interfere in jobs, with jobs and employment and earnings and those things. There's already people doing that that know what they're doing. Why is government coming in and, and regulating and penalizing and all of these things that are just not the proper role of government and they never were the intent of our founding fathers? Thank you. Mr. Knighting, as a legislator, what would your first priority be in working towards a balanced budget? Uh, my first priority would be absolutely living within our means. We are to borrow nothing. And I know this may mean hard times could be ahead initially, but it's like, it's like when a, a plane is landing, you have to drop the elevation and then get used to that. And then you drop it some more and you get used to that. And eventually you're on the ground. We don't need to have this mad rush to, to, to land the plane, but but we need to uh, we need to lower our our expectations and and lower the. Uh, can you just repeat the question? Because I sure. As a legislator, what would your first priority be in working towards a balanced budget? Okay, we we need we need to not live beyond our means. So the, the same what applies to a family applies to the family of government in the state of Arizona. We, we need to land this plane so that we are no longer borrowing money and accepting money from the federal government at all. We might need to, 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 to get on the ground. But when we're on the ground, by the way, that means that we're not borrowing any money. We're not living beyond our means at all. We're not borrowing from the federal government at all. We're not accepting money from the federal government at all. Because any money that, that we accept is, is a sweat from other people who have worked. Why, it's dishonorable to accept that money. And not only that, but the federal government's like, ha we gave you money, we lent you money, you're gonna do what we say. And uh, we need to be more independent, especially independent of the federal government. That's the way we're gonna balance the budget, is to not live beyond our means and to have a practice to where we lower 
that plane and higher our standards of borrowing money and spending money. Thank you. Next question. What do you think of Arizona's current image and what, if anything, would you do to change it? I like Arizona's image. That's why I'm here. I think Arizona's a great state to live. I think it, it presents a, a, a wonderful image. You have the, the Native American people here. You have the, uh, the big city of Phoenix here and the surrounding suburbs. And uh, I, my brother lives in Phoenix. I have family and friends live in Phoenix. I think it's a great area. You have Flagstaff. You have uh, a mixture of people and de a demographic mix of people that I think is wonderful. But we also have illegal aliens coming across the border. And uh, I stand with Sheriff Arpaio, where we have to uh, we have to obey the law, basically. I mean, right now there's a discussion where, well, you know, are illegal immigrants really illegal? Well, yes, that's why they're called illegal immigrants, and uh, illegal immigrants shouldn't be in this country because it's illegal. And so, I would like to help the image of Arizona by securing our border borders independently as a state and not waiting for the federal government to do more of nothing or to make things worse by passing amnesty or, or to bully us and tell us what they're going to do and, and we have no authority. We do have the authority here in this state. We're a sovereign state and we don't need the federal government coming in to tell us anything. And if we're independent that way, if we lead America, all the other states, in being that independent, we'll be known more for our independence and other states will follow. Other states will follow the lead of Arizona, the independent state, the state that does not borrow or, or take the federal government's opinion, but just that, it's their opinion. Thank you. On healthcare, what was your opinion of Governor Brewer's decision last year to expand Medicaid in Arizona? Government's, Governor, uh, Governor Brewer's decision was wrong. Healthcare is in the same position as employment. When our founding fathers won the independ our independence uh, and obtained the strength of the Lord in doing so, it wasn't on the pretense to take care of all of us. The, the government has no business involved in health care, just like it has no business involved in, in jobs and earnings and those types of things. It's, it's just, it needs to be left to the free market system. And Medicaid is, is a collective theft. It's legalized plunder. It's, I, if I couldn't steal from my friend Glenn, or else I'd get thrown in jail. But the government can steal from other people. It's their money, it's their sweat, but we're stealing from them. And we're allowing many, many people Medicaid. And, and people can say, well, you know, that's heartless, whatever. It's not the business of government to be involved in charity. It's just not. If we were not involved in charity, what would happen is individual people and individual organizations and groups would rise because of the collective uh, charity spirit of Americans, and they would provide those services to people that are in need. But we're, we're like, uh, you know, I, I, it's like Charles Barkley, of all people to quote, said, I saw on Facebook the other day, he says, yeah, those people, they've been Democrats for generations and they're still poor. Because we're in the business of feeding the professionally poor and giving Medicaid and Medicare attention to the professionally poor. It takes away incentive for people to be independent and for people to do for themselves. Government has no business in the healthcare industry. Thank you. Our next question is on education. What is the role of the state government when it comes to education, and how would you address a school that is underperforming? See, that's why I knew this 
this would be easy, this question and answer, because most of all these questions, the government has no business being involved in. And education, we all grew up, I graduated from a public uh, high school and, and that, and, and uh, so I, I grew up used to, oh yeah, the government runs education. The government has no business in education. The, uh, the tenth plank of the Communist Manifesto is government education. We're becoming more communist by having government education. Why shouldn't it be left up to the free market system? What's wrong with that? Like, uh, uh, one person asked my friend, you know, well, what would we do then what, if, if the government wasn't providing education? And his answer was, what, what do shoe salesmen's, salesmen do when they want to sell their shoes? It's up to the free market system. We, it was not the intent of our founding fathers to have government run education. And uh, we are in it, we're in it very, very deep. And so again, this plane needs to land. We don't need to just cut it off and say from now on, we're gonna have education be in the, the free market system, but we need to be leaning towards that direction and we need to incrementally, year by year, pass legislation that moves in that direction. Because then ultimately in 10 years, we could be this independent state that I talked about earlier, setting the tone, setting the leadership for all the other states by having a free market education, education system. And that's, that's just allowing the flower to bloom, the flower of freedom and liberty. It's just allowing that flower to grow up and to be fertilized and to have all the nutrients it needs without the poison the government pours into it for, to allow that flower to bloom and to grow and to become what it was supposed to become without government interference. Thank you. What specific role does the state have when it comes to immigration and protection of the border? Uh, state, we're currently in a situation where the state is fighting with the federal government on whose authority it is to protect our borders. Now, originally, yes, it is the federal government's job to protect our borders. But if they don't do that, then it's the duty of the state to do it. And so it suddenly becomes our problem. These people are coming into our state. You know, if they're going into Texas, we'll let Texas worry about that. They're coming into Arizona. And uh, I have a lot of friends uh, that are that are illegal immigrants, and uh, I sympathize with them wanting to come to a country that's more free than where they came from. I totally sympathize with that. But when they go through the process, the intentionally hard process of letting these people come in legally, it will mean more to them, and we will keep out the criminals that way. And so it is, it is our obligation to protect our borders when the federal government can't. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, I know that this is a heart-wrenching problem for, for all those stories. I read one the other day where a Cuban person, his wife came and half of them died on the ship and she managed to make it here because of a law that says that if you're from Cuba, you can come through Mexico on foot and we'll accept you and those types of things, and then her husband was there waiting for her, and they, had, they were kissing, and they were, they were reunited as a family, and I love to see that. But it sends the wrong message, because it, it's government playing on your emotions to try to support, because they want you to support amnesty, because they want you to support illegal immigration. It's still illegal. And uh, the, the, I feel strongly in the traditional uh, the traditional federal government role of keeping the aliens out. Thank you. Colorado and Washington have legalized recreational marijuana recently. Should Arizona do this? No, we shouldn't except for in cases of religious or medical needs. Um, mar marijuana you know, the, our government would love for all of us to be these marijuana-taking uh, zombies that just says, yes, yes, government, we'll do what you want. Let us just smoke our weed, you know. 
and just, yeah, you know, the, 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 the marijuanaization of America is not what we need. However, if it's your religion or you have a legitimate medical need for marijuana, then I would support allowing it for those two reasons. But for recreational reasons, you're, uh, it's debauchery. It's what the founding fathers would call debauchery. They, you know, pornography and these certain things, they, they, uh, they're cat they were categorized as debauchery and they don't strengthen a country, they weaken a country. And if, if you're in an area and the community allows it, you know, that, that uh, if the community votes for it, then maybe we should allow it as a state. But if it, it, you're, not, you're not helping anybody by allowing marijuana into society. And yes, I know it might be worse. It might not be as bad as alcohol, but uh, let's say it's half as bad as alcohol. We've already allowed alcohol, it's too late. It's, uh, we, we, we can't really undo that. Do we wanna really make things worse? Do we wanna really allow these drugs that are harmful to people? Even though they're, well, according to studies, no one's died in marijuana taking all that stuff. You know what, it creates, a, it creates a population of zombies that will not fight or resist government. And my personal motto is when, when laws get corrupt, rebellion is duty. And uh, the government would like nothing more than people that aren't going to rebel, even though it's duty when laws become corrupt. So thank you. Thank you. And our last question for the evening. What is your position on guns being allowed in public buildings? I think you know my position by now from what I've previously stated. The Second Amendment is the... Uh, is the, the foundation of a free society. I could, I could read you so many quotes that the Founding Fathers, what they had to say, and remember, their voice is the loudest. I don't think we can argue differently. Guns should be allowed any, everywhere. Guns should be allowed in all public places. They should be allowed on planes. We, if we had an armed society, we would have reluctant criminals and that's, that's, just, uh, that's just the fact that incentive, which is the key to everything, whether you're talking about jobs or anything, with jobs, when you create an incentive by taking away government re restriction, people will venture out and explore their talents and abilities. When you, um, when you don't allow guns with the assumption that criminals will obey those laws, we're, we're, we're just in the twilight zone. We're, we're nowhere near what the founder's intent was. Uh, guns should be allowed everywhere. I have the right to protect myself, to protect my family with a tank if I feel that it's needed. Everything should be uh, not off, uh, prohibited. Everything should be allowed. And uh, if, if that was the case, you probably, uh, some of you may remember the, the great quote by the, the Chinese, uh, a general where he says, we can't attack the US, there'll be a gun be behind every blade of grass. Google it, it's there. I can't remember who it's by, but it's there. Why are we allowing our government to take away our guns? You know, and, and, they, and they, they tried, and then there was an influx of gun purchases because everyone wants to protect themselves. When, uh, when government becomes corrupt, when laws become corrupt, rebellion becomes duty. Thank you. We will now move into closing statements. Mr. Knighting, would you please start with your closing remarks? Three minutes, right? Yes. All right. I, uh, I want you to get to know me a little bit more as a person and some of the other things that I've accomplished. I, uh, I have a master's degree in geography. I work as a statistician for a hospital on the Navajo Nation Reservation. I'm living among the Navajo Indians on purpose. That's my intent. I want to be there. I want to live among the Native Americans. I've also, at 430 pounds, I, uh, well, at over 400 pounds, I've ran three marathons, and I'm the Guinness World Record holder for being the heaviest person to complete a marathon. Google it, look it up. 
ran three marathons. I'm a five-time U.S. sumo champ in the U.S. I've represented the United States 10 times at World Sumo Championships competition and one, at, one other time as the U.S. coach, which was a, a month ago. And also a month ago, just before I went to Taiwan to the World Sumo Championships, I, uh, I swam 14 miles in the Bear Lake and, and uh, reached a double crossing, meaning I crossed the width once, seven miles, and crossed it again, seven miles. I'm in the Bear Lake Swimming Association books. It took me 16 hours and 13 minutes to do it. But that's my, that's my new pursuit is swimming. I want to swim the English Channel. But uh, I'm doing these things for influence. And my passion is educating people on the original intent of the Founding Fathers. If people understood their intent and the formula that gave freedom to this country, our country would not be in this, this mess that we're in now. We're in, a, we're in a mess in a way that, well, you know, the Founding Fathers in that era, that was a long time ago, things don't apply then that do now. Do principles apply everywhere at all times equally? Of course they do. If you're not supposed to kill, if thou shalt not kill, a hundred years ago, that same principle applies today. And so the Founding Fathers had virtually every solution for today's dilemma in America. And all we have to do is get back on track to what they already discovered through the grace of God and by petition to God. Read about it, study. Study correct books, study uh, enlightened books, and you'll find that God was very much in the picture of our founding father era. And that same, those same passions that the, our founding fathers had exists in the hearts of men today. But we just need people to follow good principles, like what they espoused. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Knighting, we thank you very much for participating in our forum tonight. And to our audience, we thank you for taking the time to come and inform yourselves before voting. We encourage you to find out more about clean elections and the candidates running for office by visiting www.azcleanelections.gov. A link to the video of this debate, as well as other clean elections debates, will be posted on that site within 72 hours of the scheduled debate. We also ask that you fill out the debate evaluation form you received as you entered and return it to one of our volunteers. Your feedback is important to the commission. Thank you and have a good night.